Welcome back to another episode of Fix Your BS, where we talk about belief systems. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Persley. We talk about belief systems in five major areas, relationships, career or business, finances, health, and faith. We found if you play in a high level in all five of those areas, your life is fantastic. And so we seek out people that are doing just that, playing at a high level in one or more of those areas. And today we've got an insane treat for you. Uh, We have Blaine Bartlett, and he consults and advises and coaches globally with leaders, executives, companies, and governments. He's internationally recognized as a leadership development master and through his work has personally delivered programs to and worked with more than 300,000 individuals, directly impacting more than 1 million people worldwide. As CEO of Avatar Resources, a global leadership consultancy, He founded in 1987. He's worked with entrepreneurs and leaders of many of the largest companies and organizations on the planet to change the way leadership is used to foster compassionate capitalism. Blaine is a co-host of Office Hours on Bloomberg TV and also Apple TV. I was actually on that season four, episode one. Appreciate you having me on that. As well as being featured in the TV series World's Greatest Motivators, and the movie and book, Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy. He's also an adjunct professor at Beijing University, managing director at the Global Coaching Alliance, and a longtime member of the Transformational Leadership Council, and serves as a member of the teaching faculty of the American Association for Physician Leadership. Blaine sits on numerous boards, including the board of directors of the World Business Academy and Unstoppable Foundation. In 2012, he was formally invested as a Knight of the Sovereign Order of St. John of Jerusalem Knights of Malta, the world's oldest humanitarian organization. Blaine is the author of five books, including the number one international bestseller, Compassionate Capitalism, A Journey to the Soul of Business, and his newest book is The Leadership Mindset Weekly. What an introduction. It is an absolute honor to have you on. Blaine, I appreciate you being on here today. And Greg, I, I'm, I'm tired just listening to that. I um, usually I don't yeah, hear the, the entire thing. Read, so uh, I would say it's it's a resume for a white a life that is well lived and has impacted a ton of people's lives, which I love. I I have had a fun life. It's not all been a bed of roses, but it is. It has not been boring. I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's great. Let's talk a little bit about that. So obviously, you know, the five pillars that we really talk about relationships, career, business, um, finances, health, and faith. I mean, which of those really speaks to you or stands out to you that you feel like you can provide some insight in? Well, yeah, I think the one that uh, anchors all of them is relationship. Um, Yeah, it's it's kind of my own personal bias that there's everything is a relationship, everything. Yeah, I have a relationship with gravity. That's how I learned to walk. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have a relationship with our finances, with our careers, with our spouses and our partners. Uh, I mean, yeah, and there's all of these various domains, but they all are yeah, embedded with relationship stuff, mm. if you will. And that's where uh, it can get messy, and it's also where it can get, a, you know, get to be a whole lot of fun. Do you find that the messy part um, has to happen in order to forge a better relationship, or is it something that you can skip altogether? What do you think about that? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Uh, I I think messy is just part of the you know, part of the puzzle. Uh, it, it really is. Uh, yeah, when you've got, and then we'll just talk about interpersonal relationships. Um, you inhabit a very unique world. I mean, every one of us does. We we inhabit unique worlds, and I I oftentimes will you know, kind of you know, jokingly talk about this. You know, there's about eight billion people on the planet, and each one of us has our own point of view, our own referencing. You know, we've got family you know, systems, family history, cultural values, societal values, education experiences, and it forges a unique world view that nobody else on the planet shares. Now. Here's where it gets really kind of complicated. Um, we all live on this same rock, on this same planet. And it's easy to assume that because we share this same space that we should all be pretty much the same. Mm. Not the case. I am continuously dealing with aliens. 
<laughs> Make, your worldview is alien to me. And so part of the success in, in life has to do with understanding that I'm, I'm interacting with an alien. Uh, and I don't mean that in any kind of a pejorative way at all. It's just that your worldview is not mine, and I can't know it the way you do. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to collaborate and work together and live together and play together, it's incumbent on me to begin to discover as much as I can your world so that I can have a basis to actually relate well. Now, that's messy. <laughs> that, 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 is, that is true. Trying to step into somebody else's shoes and see their perspective is... Uh, is obviously something that is hard, but much needed. It has to be done in order to really get somebody's point of view. But honestly, like you just said, you're never going to 100% get it because you have different life experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and that's where things kind of get uh, interesting. I mean, if I believed what you believe, I would behave the way that you behave. So the, the only thing that's visible to me is your behavior. I can't and get into your brain and into your mind to experience what you're experiencing or to think the way that you think. All I see is your behavior. So if I can understand that behavior is the analog to meaning making, yeah, I make up yeah, I make up meaning about things in my world and I respond to them based on the meaning that they <laughs> that they hold for me. And that's my behavior. Mm. And if I thought the way that you did, I would behave the way that you did. So Rather than getting you know, all wrapped around the axle and upset because your behavior doesn't match what I think it should be, it's an, it, that literally is an invitation for me to explore. Mm. Yeah, to tell me more. It's kind of like, yeah, how do you see this such that that behavior gets, gets generated here? My, my, my wife and I have a ball with this. Yeah, you know, some of the time I don't mean fun necessarily. It's kind of like, <laughs> okay, let's back the truck up on this and uh, let's have a conversation. Well, that goes back to the uh, the biblical reference where it talks about be curious like a child, right? I mean, it's it's you should always just have this curiosity of tell me. It, it, this is one of the reasons why I really love talking about belief systems is because when people connect things belief wise, they say, well, this equals that. This is what I believe, and that's just the way it is. They never revisit it, and if you don't believe the same, then they're going to fight against you, and and that's where this big ball of clutter comes about. And if you just take that. That what you just said that, hey, have a little little um, childish excitement about it and be like, well, let's see what this le leads, you know. Um, my wife calls it, you know, my wife and I call it mischief, you know, Ooh, a little get into a little yeah. mischief. Yeah. So uh, that's awesome. So do you have any um, tips or hints or tricks that people can use to maybe look into themselves or look into their relationships to where they can maybe, um, you know, develop better ones? Is there anything you've experienced that you could help them with that? Well, yeah, there are a couple of different things here. Yeah, you know, one, yeah, curiosity. I mean, just kind of like you're talking about the yeah the, the the mind of a beginner, the the curiosity or the inquisitiveness of a child. But curiosity by itself isn't enough. Curiosity, if I really um, follow the thread, leads to um, uh, inquiry, leads to interest. Now, so if I'm curious, now I become interested. Um, so I want to, yeah. And that interested curiosity can be satisfied pretty quickly, but interested is an invitation to explore. Um, but I don't become interested automatically necessarily. Curiosity is al almost always the precursor to that. Mm. So, uh, I, yeah, I mean, that's one thing that I can play with. The other, I mean, my first book, uh, you know, you know, your, Discover Your Inner Strengths, I wrote that with Stephen Covey and Brian Tracy. And there was an area in the book when I uh, was, was putting that the, the, the chapter together that I'm thinking of here about levels of discernment, um, yeah, kind of what I pay attention to and how I pay attention. And the base level, and this kind of comes out of some Buddhistic uh, teachings, but the, the base level of discernment is judgment. Mm. And that's where things go south pretty quickly. This is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad. Uh, I like this, I don't like that. And it's all values-based. And because it's values-based, it's very personal. Okay? My values are different than yours. So if all I do is interact with others on the basis of judgment, I'm always going to have dis a disagreement, mm -hmm. conflict, upset, all that kind of stuff. So I, I want to be able to bump it up a level 
And that next level up actually uh, comes into the, uh, the kind of the noticing area where it's, it's, it's more about evaluation. Is this working or not working? Which is different than is this good or bad, right or wrong? Yeah, the, the question of working or not working is a values-free assessment of the situation. And how does all how do you think ego and emotion plays into that? Um, we talk a lot about the two E's, ego and emotion, talking about evaluation versus judgment. I mean, where does that come into play, do you think? Uh, the, 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 the difficulty in transiting from judgment to evaluation, oftentimes I put myself, I literally put myself in the position of being wrong. Mm. And now intellectually, I can understand the value in being wrong. I can get, yeah, new, new learning comes as a consequence of that. But I have never met anybody in my life that likes the experience of being wrong. <laughs> and that's the emotion, that piece. The ego, yeah, the purpose of the ego is to protect the status quo. That's yeah. the purpose of the ego. And yeah, the status quo doesn't need protecting. <laughs> and by status quo, I'm talking. I'm, I'm really talking about my identity, my sense of who I am. Mm. Uh, and it's and, and that's a fabrication. Yeah, who I am is made up. Yeah, it's made up by me, and you know it's contributed to by a whole lot of you know, other folks out there. But essentially. I, I uh, this you know, this this persona um, that's got the name on it, Blaine Bartlett, is a made up artifact. You know, have yeah. you listened to Jim Carrey talk about that? Jim, Jim Carrey talks about that a lot, where he talks about you know I've been a, I've I've acted the part of Jim Carrey for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Aldous Huxley talks about that in the perennial philosophy. Alan Watts, you know, behind the yeah in the green room, mm. yeah. Yeah, there's he's got this whole little thing on that. I love Alan so, Watts. Listen to him a lot. Oh, yeah. Alan Watts is rich. He's just got some amazing stuff. That's awesome. So, yeah. So that whole area of discernment, uh, and then and then you start connecting the dots from evaluation. You start looking. You know, where's the application on this? And this is where the for the sake of what uh, comes into play for me. And I'm not talking about vision or the why I'm in a relationship. There has to be something more tangible. And for me, it's that for the sake of what? Mm. What does it make possible? What does being in this relationship with you make possible for me that I wouldn't get to have, do, or be if I wasn't in this relationship? That's all. Awesome. If I identify that, then the nature of evaluation becomes a lot easier to, to actually work with. That is awesome. Yeah. What, a, what an amazing insight. That That's fantastic. I mean, that's something that um, we talk about a lot in relationships and like different groups and stuff and um, where people's relationships start to fail when they start protecting themselves and become very selfish. And that's where the ego and the emotion kind of the ego kicks in and the emotion comes out. And so, um, you know, what happens is, is that everything becomes very um, directed at the other person instead of trying to help them and be selfless towards them. They become selfish and say, well, it's your fault and I'm going to blame you. And and therefore, um, you know, I'm not to blame because you're to blame. And that's the crumbling of the whole whole process. But what you're saying basically the opposite is like, look, if you could, instead of casting judgment towards the other person, you could just evaluate the situation, taking the ego and emotion out and just saying, you know, what are we in this for? And, and what really a relationship should be, you complete me and make me a better version of myself. And I complete you and make you a better version of yourself. And therefore, we should be better because we're together. It, 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 does that kind of sum it up for you, or is there a better way to put that? Yeah, in one sense, I mean that's you know a very common way of thinking about it. Uh, and here, for for me, the difficulty on that is the assumption that I'm not complete. Uh, I actually am complete. Now, I may not recognize all of the completeness in me, which is where other people come into play here. There's nobody out there but me. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of a meme that I work off of. So if I notice you and I'm attracted to you, I'm really noticing an element of me that is present in you, and I want to bring that closer to me. And that's the experience of com you know be becoming complete. Mm. Uh, but it's something that was latent in me to begin with. I wouldn't have noticed it if it wasn't yeah resident in me. And the same goes on the shadow side as well. Um, 
I mean, if I'm triggered by something out there, there's a part of me that's got this little shadow piece that's kind of in play here. <laughs> and th that's the beauty of a marriage, I think. You know, yeah, the, the, the best marriages that I've ever encountered, and I include mine with, uh, with Cynthia in this, is not free of argument, conflict, <laughs> frustration, or any of that stuff. All of those things are ways that I get to work on me. Mm. When when she does something that triggers me, it's kind of like, okay, first move, what's going on in here? Mm. Okay, what do I need to come? What do I need to come to grips with? Mm. Uh, it's not it's not her. <laughs> I mean, she's just living well, her life. That's the, easy, that's her. the easy way out, right? The easy way is to say it's your fault. You need to change, which you have no control over in the, the heart. And that's what we're, we're taught in our society, I think, is that, uh, you know, you, you should blame others or other things or circumstances and become the victim of it. And then you have no control. And that feels, you know, nobody likes to be out of control. Yeah. I mean, that's where anger, I mean, anger, uh, frustration, uh, resentment, those, those sorts of, you know, what are called negative emotions. They're always the consequence of feeling out of control. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, out of control. Absolutely. Out of, yeah. So I get angry. I get frustrated. I get you know, resentful. I mean, because I don't feel like I can control the situation. And control is such an illusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only thing I can control is my thoughts, my feelings, and my behavior. And even my behavior is in question a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, and studies show that 95% of my behavior is is uh, triggered by subconscious, out of awareness, belief systems, dynamics, value structures that are so deeply rooted. Mm. And all we have to do is look at New Year's resolutions to understand that dynamic. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're talking a lot about what I've listened to Bob Proctor talk about, you know, that subconscious versus conscious. And I love what he talks about um, and just trying to unlock your own self, your own potential. Um, and Sanguru talks about that a lot. He's like, just, you know, it's nothing out there is is what you need to be worried about. Just just worry about that. You don't even have to worry about it. Just let it go. Let it be. Surrender. The Surrender Experiment is another really great oh, book. I really yeah, enjoy. Yeah. 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 You know him, I guess. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, the surrender experiment is great too. It's just surrender to the flow uh, and and act on your the things that give you the the highest um, enjoyment or excitement or passion. Where whatever is passionate to you, you should act on that thing, whatever that is in that moment. And that's a really tough thing to do because we we have these ideas of I have to be this person or I have to do this thing or what will people think of me if and and man, that's hard to do. Is there is there any secrets that you've come up with or any things that will help people be able to do that for themselves. Laughter. Ooh. Yeah, you know, it, I'm not getting out of this alive. So I mean, somebody <laughs> a long time ago said to me, if you're skating on thin ice, you may as well dance. And <laughs> that's key. I, I, I laugh a lot, um, usually at myself. <laughs> it's kind of like, well, there I go again. Um, this journey is 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 really. I mean, it, it's 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 a what's the word I'd use here uh, from a theater? It, it's it's a uh, dramatic comedy, I guess. Mm. But it, yeah, but the comedy actually leads. Yeah, we get caught up in the drama, but what I can pull back, I can start to laugh at it. Uh, and like I said, nobody's getting out of here alive. I'm I'm not getting out of here alive. So what I'm taking seriously today. <laughs> Maybe not so much. <laughs> There's that quote by Jim Rohn. Everything's risky. I'll tell you how risky it is. You're not getting out of it alive. You want to take a risk? Be bored. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to happen. And it's funny, though. Uh, uh, Tony Robbins talks about that, where if you're in a fight with someone or you have this emotional um, response where you're having the, you know, you don't like the emotion, you're angry, you're frustrated, whatever. He's like, if you want to knock the other person out of their their loop, of their habit of being in this loop, um, you can just start laughing or do something that totally gets them out of their their yeah. moment. And they're like, what? It just totally triggers them differently. It's interesting. We are so habituated in our behavior that it, it literally is a patterned way of, of living life. Mm. And here's, here's the key on this. If you can interrupt the pattern, you can inject something different into the situation. As long as the pattern is running, 
it's almost impossible to interject something different into it that will actually take and work. So laughter is a great interrupter. It's a great pattern interrupter. It makes me want to laugh when you say that, and I just start, start giggling. That's awesome. Um, so how would somebody, you know, I talk about the four A's a lot where you um, become aware, then you acknowledge it, and then you um, act on it, and then you attack, meaning take massive action on the thing you're, you're doing, the act, action that you decided you're going to do. But how does someone become aware that they're in the, a pattern or, you know, how would you say that someone even identifies that, man, this is happening as a repeat, repeated thing? Well, that's the you know, part of the way is you begin to recognize that there is a repetition that seems to be in play here. Mm. Uh, I look up one day and I kind of go, you know, this looks real familiar. <laughs> this sounds real familiar. The, uh, yeah, the idea of uh, noticing is, is is really, I think, important with this because, you know, there, there's a poem by uh, somebody by the name of R.D. Lang that I've used a lot in the work I do. Um, the range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice. And because we fail to notice it, we fail to notice there's little we can do to change mm -hmm. until we notice how failing to notice shapes our thoughts and deeds. Now, that's kind of a mouthful, but the key on it is awareness. The range of what I think and do is limited by what I fail to notice. I can't, I can't expand until I notice that I'm not noticing, that I'm not mm -hmm. paying attention. Yeah. And we talk a lot with people about, you know, you get out of the box and you know, just get out of the box. You well, know, people don't know what the box is because they aren't really paying attention. So I look for patterns. I, I you, you start paying attention to what seems to be repeating itself. And then you, you, you get curious mm -hmm. and then you get interested as a consequence of that you know, curiosity. I seem to be triggered by this kind of a person. Hmm, I wonder where that comes from. And then you get interested in spelunky. <laughs> you just mm -hmm. kind of dig. And you go, ah, okay. And it's not about laying on a you know, therapist's couch for seven years. Awareness, you know, um, Fritz Perls at one point in time said awareness, uh, the potential of, yeah, the, the beauty of awareness is that it's curative. I don't have to go back and really relive money on my entire history. And once I become aware, new choices open up. And that's the real power of awareness is it illuminates different choices. And, That's amazing. And then, and at that point in time, you can go to what's working, what's not working. Mm -hmm. At that, I mean, you're giving basically a master class in how to look internally and be able to change the habits that you don't really enjoy or don't that don't end up creating an emotion or a experience that you enjoy. We talk a lot about that in my mastermind groups. Is is re, the first few steps of. Uh, of developing your life you want. Really, I say there's five, but the first few are, number one, you got to create a vision. You got to have some sort of thing that you're you're looking at into the future, a creative something. What does that look like? What does it feel like? How do, can you create emotion around it? The second part is you have to take consistent, constant, correct action toward that thing. So that consistent, constant, correct action, you take it toward that thing. Um, and so one of the things we have them do is we have them draw uh, a line and we say on the le left side, I want you to write down all the habits and actions and things that you do on a regular basis that drive you toward that vision. And on the right side, all the habits and actions, things that you do that drive you away from that vision. And then you have a list and you go, now we're going to start identifying these things on this side and moving them over here. We're going to create new actions or habits. And that's really what you're talking about. Become aware. I'm in a situation. I'm in an emotional situation. I don't like get curious. What, how did this happen? How am I here? I don't like this. It feels uncomfortable. How do I get out of this or do it? Uh, notice it to where I don't have this recurring again. And then what can I change it by doing different actions? I mean, that's pretty much what you're saying, which is awesome. That's uh, yeah. Yeah. A, a, di a different action will produce a different result. Yeah. It can't not. <laughs> Please, yep. as well. So when you're in a situation you don't like, it's pretty simple. You just look and you go, how did I get here? What, what, I don't like this. What's going on? What's happening around me? Let's notice what's going on. Don't get emotional about it. Just uh, take the emotion out and the ego out and just identify and, and move forward with new uh, new actions to get the better result and, and then pay attention and go, did that work or not? Yeah. yeah. Do you think there's a lack of people that really get that emotional intelligence as they, as they age? Because- I really talk about, um, you know, becoming mature is really just emotional intelligence. 
becoming emotionally intelligent. So, I mean, do you people do you think there's a lack of that? Are people doing a good job, or could they do better? I I I, I, I agree with you on that. I think, but yeah, age is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If if I'm open to it, and uh, most people tend to be, I think, yeah, open to you know developing some wisdom over mm. time, and you you can use wisdom and emotional intelligence in in almost the same kind of a you know, linguistic frame here. It's you know they're basically the same when you start really sussing it out. Um, but emotional intelligence, you know, there's energy and emotions. So I, I want to have the emotions are the frequency setters. That's that. I mean, that's the that's how the human works is through frequency, and emotions are the vibrational frequencies of the human being. Our thoughts are one thing, but how do we? What's the feeling structure that we have with those? And this is where the whole law of attraction work actually you know, uh, is is rooted. And it's you know, the law of attraction is a secondary law. The first law is the law of vibration. Mm. Everything. Everything vibrates. And if you're vibrating in concert with anything, it will be in your experience. So the beauty of emotion is that when you can begin resonating yeah, in concert with and in frequent in resonance with that dream, yeah, what does it feel like? Don't just imagine it as a picture, but what does it feel like in your body? That bump in frequency by definition, is going to put you in a different plane, frequency plane, that will be populated by different things that are consistent with that frequency plane. They may not show up right now, but if you hold that state, high fidelity, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you will begin to notice, well, where did that come from? That's interesting. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't have brought that in if I'd planned. Yeah, that sort of stuff. You know, it's it's interesting. I love this conversation because it's literally, it, it reiterates a lot of the things I hear and a lot of the things I talk about. But, you know, the third step, like I was talking earlier, I have a shortcut. The three steps, vision is number one, create a vision. How does it feel? What's the emotional attachment to that? Number two is create uh, constant, consistent, correct action toward that vision, just constantly working toward it. But number three is eliminate the um, control of when and how that thing will occur. You know, uh, you got to, that's the surrender side of it. And that's exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about just, just, Hey, you know, stop trying to force things. Just get yourself into that higher frequency and then see what happens. Watch what happens. You know, it's, it's right there for you. It's all available. You just got to match that frequency. So if somebody's identifying right now and going, man, I'm in a frequency state or I'm in a state of emotion that I really don't enjoy on a regular basis. Are there any things that you would say how they could raise that state of energy, that frequency to say, I'm going to be up here and I my standard is this. I'm going to stay here a majority of the time instead of being down here and the frustrated and annoyed and angry and all these negative emotions. How would you say to yeah. get there? The easiest way, and I say easiest, it's a relative term, um, is, uh, well, I, 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 I'll use the word meditation, but I don't really mean meditation. But basically, I'm talking about quieting the noise. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, the chatter that goes on in our mind is, I mean, studies show that we have you know, somewhere between 70 and you know, 80,000 thoughts a day. Yeah. I mean, just like popcorn, they're just, yes. yes. <laughs> My mom used to talk about farts and skillets. I mean, they're just, <laughs> they're bouncing all over the place. There's so much noise. I want to be able to quiet the noise long enough that I can get in touch with that experience. And, um, one of the ways in that meditative structure that I can work with is the idea of gratitude. Um, now, and here's the magic of gratitude. It's impossible for anybody to experience, I mean, experience gratitude for something they don't possess or something that they haven't experienced. Gratitude is only experienced in the moment of presence with that ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you work with gratitude. The experience of gratitude supposes that it's already here. Yeah, the, the it being whatever it is that I, it's not out there someplace. It resides in my heart. It resides in my soul. Everything is invented twice. First as an idea and then in, in physical form. Secondly, I want to get in touch with that idea, the ideation, and, and actually experience it. And gratitude is the gateway to that experience. 
So in my meditation practice, if if there's something significant that I'm really looking to yeah, you know, have in my life, I want to settle into it and be yeah, and really experience being grateful for its presence. That I yeah, it begins I begin to match the frequency. I'm grateful for the experience that this brings to me. Mm. What about the gratefulness for the experiences or the emotional experiences that you don't enjoy when things don't go the way you expect and you have this emotional reaction? How how would you say somebody, because it's I think it's easy to be grateful for the good stuff, but it's like one of those things where people imagine running a marathon, they imagine signing up and then they imagine the start line and then they imagine the finish line when they're finished and they're, everybody's wrapping everything around them. And, oh, you got your medal. Uh, yeah. What about those 26 miles? Because about 13, <laughs> yeah. it's going to hurt real bad. And you're not going to be so grateful in that moment. So how do you, how do you get yourself? Better done. Yeah, right. Uh, how do you get, get yourself trained to say, I will be great, grateful no matter what? Yeah. So it's a, it's a linguistic shift. It moves away from I will be, which is a future state declaration, to I am grateful, no matter what. Mm. I am grateful. I am experiencing gratitude for the body that allows me to run 26 miles. Mm. I, so yeah, so you, you play with the language a little bit. Language creates reality. It also is a reflector of reality. So going back to yeah, how do I become more aware? I start paying attention to my language, mm. both my internal talk, but also the one that I ex yeah express outwardly. Yeah, because it gives me a, a, it gives me information about what's what's the consciousness that is generating this experience of reality. You know, one of the things I talk about too, and you just reiterated it again, is I tell people to change the phrase "I want" to "I have," mm -hmm. and "I will" to "I am," and uh, really work on rephrasing that and paying attention to say, you know, uh, I want to be wealthy or I want a million dollars. Say I have a million dollars. I am wealthy. Um, and people don't really understand that, but it, they have to re really work at it because I worked at it for a long time. But that, yeah. that lack mindset of, I want that, I wish I had, I'm not good. And it's a, it's a lack, a uh, scarcity type mindset, scarcity type statement. And really what you're reiterating in your brain is, you don't have it. <laughs> so therefore you're attracting it. Yeah. Uh, you don't have it. That's what you're attracting. So um, when you say meditation, how long of a practice do you do? And what do you really do as far as that goes? Yeah, I've been meditating about eh, 45 years now. Um, yeah, it's really run the gamut in terms of <laughs> what I've done. What, you know, what I do today um, is... Yeah. About yeah, two to three times a day, I'll sit and just become quiet for about ten minutes. Yeah, it, 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 I'm not interested in a, in a fourteen hour meditation process. Uh, yeah, ten minutes just to quiet things down, reconnect to what it is that I'm you know you're moving with, uh, and and I do it yeah two to three times a day. Yeah, usually three times a day, and I start the day with it, and that's part of my reading. I mean, I, I study every morning. And uh, in the study, you know, part of that study process is a meditation piece, yeah, on a you know, particular you know, piece that I'm either writing or reading. And then, yeah, around, you know, lunchtime or noon, yeah, it's kind of like, okay, take a breath, step back, slow things down. And then before I go to bed, it's kind of like, okay, let's uh, put it, you know, let's implant mm. what it is that you're working with so that, yeah, in the dream state, which is a creative state, yeah, I, I've, I've planted some seeds. You know, it's so much simpler than what most people think meditation is. They think in terms of the way you're sitting and you have to quiet the mind, which I don't think it's really possible to quiet the mind. I think you have to direct your mind to focus on something. Um, that's, key. that's key. Okay. All right. Good. Learn, I, you know, I'm just, you constantly learn stuff. And then what's funny is, is later on, sometimes you learn it and you go, that wasn't a hundred percent correct. I thought it was at the time, but um, but it's nice to have other people that have been there and, and uh, with all the experience you have to uh, to reiterate it, I guess. Um, but that that is so hard for people to just stop because we live in such a, a, a society of just go and noise and just chaos. And um, 
what would you recommend, I guess, for somebody to say, how can they implement that into their lives if they, if, you know, set a timer on your phone or is it, is it, Hey, when you sit down to eat, just take five minutes or, you know, whatever, what, what would you recommend for them? Just figure it out on their own or. Yeah, it is. It's going to be kind of dependent on their situation, their lifestyle, that sort of thing. Um, but like anything, it, it takes some practice. Uh, you know, to the point of, you know, we're so busy. We we are adrenaline junkies by at large. There is so much stimulation going on in our lives, typically, um, that we become addicted to it, and that pause feels uncomfortable. I mean, yeah. So, to those of you that are listening right now, I want you to just fold your arms. Just fold your arms in front of you. Yeah, no, yeah. So everybody can do that yeah. now. Do it the other way. Oh, that's awkward. <laughs> it's, yeah, but you can do it. Uh, but it will, in order for it to feel comfortable and familiar, you have to practice it, and that's what you're doing. Is it, yeah, with a yeah, if you're new to a meditation practice or a quieting practice, basically all you're doing is practicing a different move. This move tends to be one that settles. As opposed to one that's frantic. We're very comfortable being frantic. It's so funny how we we forget when you're a child, you know, you try something new. Uh, a great example is always riding the bike. You try riding the bike and you fail and you get up and you get back on it and you don't think anything of it and you just keep going and you oh, fell over. Oh, get up, keep going. It's it's interesting how as we become, become adults and, and world the world does its thing to us and we we forget that you know, failing isn't necessarily a fail. It's it's just a learning process of, well, that didn't work. Now what? And how can I learn from that? And moving on to the next thing. And when something's new, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be awkward and odd, but it doesn't mean you should stop. So if there's anything I've taken away, it's I need to get back in to make sure I am really being aware of the thoughts that are coming out and going in, but also the meditation practice of a couple times a day, slowing down and stopping and taking a moment Five minutes, five minutes, five, yeah, maybe 10, something like that. Yeah. You know, right. the, the idea of success, because this is, you know, essentially what all of your listeners are, are, are organizing you know, their, their lives around is being successful in relationship in the five, the five pillars that you work with. For me, it's a sustainable success. Yeah. You know, over a lifetime is about developing the capacity to continuously start over. It's as simple as that and as difficult as that. Developing the capacity to continuously start over. And I emphasize starting over because if I'm not starting over, I'm not growing. Mm. You know, people find themselves in ruts all the time in their relationships, in their careers, in their finances, in their physical health. They, they get in ruts. And a friend of mine years ago said, you know what a rut is? And I said, no, what's a rut? He says, it's a coffin with the ends kicked out. And I went, okay. <laughs> it couldn't have been a more apt description. Yeah. You get stuck in this pattern and there's no growth. Mm. That's that's a great analogy of just picturing that. You're like, wow. And and people do that. They get stuck in that rut where they aren't doing the things that they are passionate about and therefore they just get less and less excited about life in general. And that's really what happens. And fear kicks in because of their ego and because of their beliefs about their past and what of what they have taken in from their past and created beliefs about. And, you know, I've heard so many people, man, I want to, how did you write a book? I want to write a book. I'm like, guess what? Start writing. That's start right. That's it. Just start writing. That's it. I don't know how to get it published. You're, what, you're putting the cart before the horse. Just start yeah. writing the book. You got to write the book. Become the author first and then get the book published, you know? Um, people get hung up on the how way too soon. Take how, when you're embarking on a new journey, take how out of the question. Absolutely take how out of it. And just imagine having that experience, being that experience, and then find ways to consistently behave in a manner that is, you know, that, that is evidence of having what you want. And you'll find yourself doing things you've never done before. The how takes care of itself. Wow. So, Blaine, I mean, we could talk 
literally for hours. I mean, you and I, I think we could just, we're like kindred spirits. Um, I'm so grateful for having you on here talking about gratitude. Uh, I really am. You've gotten a, gotten me a little bit um, excited about, you know, the next chapter of, of, of the next couple of weeks of just looking at, okay, I need to retune, refine some of these things. And that's why it's so important for people to listen to podcasts like, like this or other podcasts is because, you know, you get lost in, in the clutter of the world. You get lost in the noise and the chaos. You got to come back to center sometimes. And this, this, this advice you gave is just absolutely classic uh, principles that will never go away. And people could really take those to heart. Um, I think we're going to have to uh, maybe have you back into the future. And this is just as maybe just the little, the the tip of the iceberg, if you will, maybe we can get a little deeper into some of these concepts, but for everybody listening, this is uh, Blaine Bartlett. Amazing guy. He's got so many accolades. It's ridiculous. Check out his new book, The Leadership Mindset uh, Weekly, and and really go back and look at compassionate capitalism because capitalism, a lot of times people view as negative, but you can have compassion in your capitalism. It's a great read. And uh, I hope you re-listen to this and take notes and let me know, you know what you get out of it. Also look Blaine up on social media. He's got some great things going on there. Look at his uh, website. You can click the link there below as well. Thanks, Blaine, again. I appreciate you. This has been a uh, Fix Your BS podcast where we talk about belief systems of the five major pillars of life, relationships, career, business, finances, health, and faith. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Persley, also known as Dr. G. And until next time, be great and fix those belief systems. Thanks, Blaine, again. Appreciate it. Pleasure, Greg. Thank you.